I have been reading Rowan Williams's new book, Looking East in Winter, and I think it's a really important book. It's quite dense. It's Rowan Williams in his full-on theological mode quite often. The advantage of which means that it keeps on giving if you wrestle with it. But I think it's got really important things to say, and so wanted to try and capture some of that now. Partly it'll be what Rome Williams himself is saying, but I should warn you it's also partly my take trying to understand what he's saying. So consider some of these thoughts. It's an important book, first of all, because it's very directly addressed to now. He several times talks about the Anthropocene, this age, as it's sometimes described, of the present, where human activity is making a tangible and often destructive impact upon the life of the planet. And that's, in fact, where the title of the book comes from, this idea of looking east in winter. In the winter time when it's cold, if you look east at the sunrise, you feel the warmth of the new sun on your face, even as you feel the chilliness at your back. And so the image captures something of where Williams thinks that we are now. He's also clear that this is about not trying to find better ethical motivation to act. That, in a way, you might say has been tried and it's failed our times are ones that need more. He talks about we don't need another ideology, we don't need another program. What we need is an epiphany, a turning back towards life that discovers life anew and then might follow in program and in action. But if we don't seek the epiphany now, he argues, we won't be able to address this Anthropocene age. Another way of putting it that he refers to to many times is that we must learn to live again more truthfully in relation towards the world and by truthfully he means seeing it as it truly is not as we fantasize it might be not as we make it for our own service not as certain limited forms of knowledge such as scientific knowledge for all of its value distort because they limit the world to use Blake's phrase into a kind of single vision making us fall into Newton's sleep. No, we must ask ourselves again what it is to see the world more truthfully. And then epiphany might come too. So that's the first point. This is very much a book addressed to now. So if it's addressed to now, then maybe another question to ask is what is our key problem? An arresting way that he summarises our problem is that we are spirits or souls, if you like, that have not become embodied enough. And by that he means that we don't know anymore the inner vitality of the whole world. The world has become a succession of objects to us without inner meaning, inner life. And very often we treat ourselves in that way. And so we can't feel and know and participate in the significance or the purpose of the world around us anymore. It means that we're inclined to see the world only in terms of our wants or fears, our unreconstituted desires. We embark on great activities of information collection that are put to the service of those untruthful ways of relating to others and the world. He puts it like this, it is the reduction of the world to an ensemble of passive objects to be desired or avoided by an individual appetite that most lethally dissolves the sense of the world. We need to recover the sense of the world anew. So how is this to happen? Well, it requires trying to see things from the biggest possible picture of which we are capable. And a recurrent phrase he uses to capture that, which again is quite arresting, is the vision of reality as non-dual and non-identity. So the phrase of non-dual is borrowed from Indian philosophy, and it's to see the unity of the being of all things, that the being I know of myself, the being you know in yourself, the being which we sense in everything around us, is 
in some way, one being. But I think Williams adds this phrase, non-identity, because he's keen to stress that, certainly in the Christian take on non-duality, this does not mean that there's not diversity, there's not distinctiveness, and it's unpacking how non-duality can coexist with non-identity, that actually the deeper sense of non-duality is grasped. So non-dual non-identity is primarily true within the life of God and then within the life of that which God creates insofar as the creation is aligned with that life of the divine. And divine non-dual non-identity means that there is actually otherness in the divine life. But it's not an otherness that implies separation. It's an otherness that implies the expansive infinity of the divine life. And so it's an otherness that celebrates in connection, in the very unity, even as it celebrates the diversity of that dancing unity. It leads to a divine life that is characterised by emanation, by communication, by participation, um, by resonance, by communication. And it's from that divine non-duality that all reality takes its qualities. And so it becomes possible to see how the non-identity which we self-evidently see around us with the sense of diversity and when we mistake it of separation is actually pointing to the non-duality of the divine life when we can feel how the being that I own in all my particularity is at the same time the being which you own in all your particularity and so similarly with all things that exist when we can hold those two things together then we get a sense of the divine non-duality which is also non-identity. Now this is celebrated particularly by Rome Williams in Trinitarian terms where the source, the word and the spirit are seen to be three in one and one in three and the vision of it works something like this that if the source has these qualities of communication, of participation, of emanation, of overflowing, that very being, without being an act that's separate from the being, leads to the presence of the sun in the divine life. And the sun is a repetition of the divine source, as Rome Williams puts it, that immediately and fully, without any kind of loss, reflects back the divine life within the divine life. But it's a threeness rather than just a twoness because that very act of emanation from source to sun and then from sun back to source is itself part of the divine life. And so the to and fro is the life of the spirit. The spirit too shares fully without any loss in this divine life. So the Trinitarian understanding is not, as it were, three people that have managed to get it together in a harmonious life. As William says, it's sometimes communicated by Christians on earth. Rather, it is an immediate expression of this non-dual, non-identity that from within its very quality, its very essence, gives rise to this otherness that's expansion, that's communication and that's a joyful, magnificent celebration of diversity in unity. Now, he develops this by discussing it in another striking way with reference to the erotic. And this is a particularly Eastern Christian way of understanding things. In the West, the erotic tends to be viewed suspiciously. And so in terms of love, people normally talk about the divine love in terms of agape, a kind of disinterested, radiant love. But Williams wants us to focus on the erotic as a way of thinking about the inner divine life. And it's appropriate because if God's simplicity, if God's unity is about intelligence, is about what's good, is about wise wisdom, it's about life itself, so too the bliss of the sun is knowing about this intelligence, about this wisdom, 
about this life itself. And it is a quality of bliss. The life of the spirit is a quality of bliss. And so that speaks of rejoicing, longing in the sense of rejoicing in this infinity fully and completely. And we have a sort of echo of that erotic longing because we don't know it completely and so want to move more fully into it. So the real, for example, joy of our intelligence is not when we learn a fact, although that can be pleasurable in itself, but it's when we experience the very capacity to know of which the fact is just a particular occasion. And so eros and knowledge come together in the delight, the wonder, as it's often remarked, of being conscious beings participating in this divine life as we know it. This divine eros is different, but we know echoes of it in another way, because it's not about wanting to collapse into another, as if the goal of eros was a kind of merger, a kind of static unity. Rather, it's the eros that wants to give life to the other, because it desires all that can possibly be rejoiced in, in the other. And this is the life of the, the word, the source and the spirit. It's a mutual desiring for all that is good and wise in the life of each other. So it's an eros that gives rather than eros that wants to possess and draw into itself. Again, it's an eros that rejoices in separation and otherness because that expands the life of all rather than pulling in into a kind of unity of collapse. Rowan Williams puts it like this at one point, he says, the creature does not become nothing as if its particularity were essentially an obstacle to God becoming God. In other words, our individuality, our uniqueness, our particularity doesn't need to be dissolved for God to be all in all. Williams continues, that would reintroduce the perennially seductive error of treating God's reality and the world's reality as competitors. Rather, he says, this kind of divine eros means that we're the bearer of an irreplaceable grace within the exchange of infinite and finite life. It's not about self-cancellation, he continues, or dissolving into a fantasy of limitless selfhood but it's about the dissolution of this image of a solid selfhood that is self-defined, self-created, self-autonomous and so on, because it knows itself in the other as much as it knows itself in itself. The non-dual teacher Rupert Spira sometimes puts this rather well when he says that finite self, which is our most immediate sense of knowing life, can know itself not as a separate individual cut off from the rest of reality, but as a reflection or a mirror of infinite reality that's shared in all the finite cells round and about. And it's when the finite rejoices in the infinite that it knows, to move back to Rowan Williams's language, that it's not in competition with other finite selves, let alone infinite life, but can continually take in that infinite life and shine it, radiate it out in celebration with others. So this distinctive way of putting things continues when Rowan Williams considers the two key concepts of kenosis and ecstasis. Um, kenosis being the kind of outflowing, the giving, the yielding up, and ecstatic meaning the receipt of things that knows itself as more than just itself, because it senses how not just it's giving, but it's also receiving from the other. Ecstasis literally means being able to step out of yourself and know life in other life. So these two are intimately linked. You know, this is not kenosis as some kind of risk that God takes in making creation that might go terribly wrong. Um, and it's not sacrifice for sacrifice's sake, as if that were the end point of sacrifice. But rather, it's the opening up, the giving of, that enables the receipt of in a mutual life together. And so kenosis and ecstasis come together. Ron Williams puts it like this in relation to the divine kenosis. He says, what it is to be the word is to be that which is poured out from the eternal source, which is itself, the eternal source is also kenotically actualized. So it's this relationship of giving, receiving, that is the fundamental quality of divine being. 
Ron Williams continues putting it like this, there is nothing that is possessed, no solid self that owns, accumulates, gives or hold backs according to its private will. And so much as the divine I am has these qualities, so the individual I ams can know that as well. We know ourselves not, you might say, as self-possessed separate individuals, but rather as maybe points or centres of communication and giving and receiving. We can know ourselves as neither completely independent, which would be not to see reality truthfully, but also as not hopelessly dependent. We are called to be agents and active to exercise a freedom in this interdependence. Williams puts it arrestingly like this when he says, to see myself as having no intrinsic worth or achievement as an individual is precisely the precondition for breaking down barriers between myself and others. So this is seeing yourself as having no intrinsic worth, not because you need to degrade or denigrate yourself, but rather because you understand that your individuality comes from this shared life, already always knowing yourself as part of a web of relationships that you don't just submit or subject yourself to, but are actively involved in the life of shaping and carrying into the future. And, and this is why the most fully realised individual is the person who shines with so much more than themselves. They radiate the divine glory. They're both at once very particular characters. You know, the Dalai Lama, for example, is definitely the Dalai Lama with all his quirks and idiosyncrasies, which are so delightful. And yet at the same time, it's that particularity which so clearly shines with much more than just... Uh, well, you could never say of the Dalai Lama that he's an independent, self-isolated, autonomous self. And similarly for Rowan Williams, speaking as a Christian, he would see this manifest in the life of the human Jesus, the incarnation of the word. And you see that in the way that Jesus was said to speak with authority. Um, he could said he could do nothing of his own, and yet he was clearly self-possessed in his life. Um, he could use his freedom to align with divine freedom, not a separate freedom. He spoke words to others that continually brought life to them. That's part of his canotic life. He saw others and the world around him as sacred, as speaking of the Father, even as he knew the Father himself. And so this is the truth of ourselves, Rowan Williams continues. Our existence is an act of loving freedom in which God unconditionally desires the joy of us as finite others. It's not a separation model between the creator and creation as often dominates theology in the West, you know, with the need for a kind of outside interv intervention to bridge an otherwise infinite gap. No, in this Eastern understanding, the infinity is precisely that which is the connection, which is an otherness that knows in an infinite expanse of life. And that is the freedom of God in creation. But for we humans, it also means that we know each other in our struggle, in our sense of suffering, in our sense of longing for this more life. Rome Williams puts it like this in another rich, rich sentence when he says, all are struggling towards mutuality the fullest possible action of reciprocally sustaining each other's lives by the gift of their own life. So we know this when life itself takes on a Trinitarian form. Love, for example, is not just a kind of transaction, an exchange of mutual pleasure, but actually grows into a third that's more than the two lovers might originally have ever thought possible or have known. Eros, this erotic love, has these qualities of kenosis, of giving, and ecstasis, stepping out of yourself into another, rather than a simple oneness or sexual self-fulfillment. The divine image in us, he says, is not a kind of part of ourselves, as if maybe our reason is the way we reflect the divine image, but rather it's a whole way of being in the world that reflects our divine image, that has these dynamic qualities. He says, we're made for limitless enlargement of desire without possession. And that happens because we respond more truthfully to the world, which when seen aright, too shares in this quality of 
unlimited enlargement of desire without possession. So this is an eros that's not about having religious experiences, say, peak experiences, or even particularly enjoying what you might call personal relationships with God as if that was somehow private. Rather, it's participating in a life that's outside of oneself as much as within oneself. But at the same time, this isn't a general experience of love. It's always known in the particular encounter, but from the particular encounter, the particular person moving into the wider life. That is the direction of travel, because to think that it's a kind of general, undifferentiated love is precisely to lose how this love is incarnated, how it reflects the action of the divine source into the divine word within the life of the divine spirit. So if that's what this Trinitarian, non-dual, non-identitarian life is like, what's the key task to see it more fully? And seeing awareness is the key focus that Williams draws out. He's drawing particularly on the Philokalia, the text of wisdom that's been gathered together, that brings together all that the Eastern Christian fathers and mothers taught about how to develop watchfulness, they called it. And it's a watchfulness of where our vision falls short in order that a wider vision might therefore be received. It's moving to what Evagrius Ponticus called the gateway of love. Evagrius also said that there's three kinds of awareness or watchfulness in the world. And the first is a kind of naive or childlike beginners, you might say, human awareness that sees things without loading them into either one of the other two types. The second type is a diabolical awareness, and that's where the experience of life becomes loaded with the need to possess, the need to have things for yourself. It's characterised by fear and, and anxiety, which Evagrius said that is what the demons know. But what we're really striving for is what he calls angelic awareness, the third type. And that is the type of sight that the angels have when they see everything in its richness and its diverse divine significance and meaning. This is what the angels enjoy in heaven and which we can enjoy on earth, where we see all the particularity of life shining and radiating with the fullness of divine life in this constant dynamic of exchange. If Agnes went so far as to say that awareness is the condition of living, knowing the life of the universe truthfully and inhabiting that yourself more and more, and forgetting that is death. It's to fall away from being as it truly is until, in principle at least, one might fall out of being altogether. And so similarly, misdirected eros is just treating a person as an object for your own pleasure rather than seeing them as the divine reflection before you, standing before you in an exchange of love. The key activity that enables this angelic watchfulness and experience is to focus on what the Eastern Church calls the passions. Now it's important to understand that by passions they don't just mean feeling. What they mean is feeling that arises from a sense of separation or from a sense of fear, a sense of anxiety. So it's from a false sense of reality rather than a true sense of reality which gives rise to the feeling of joy and exuberance of canotic giving and ecstatic stepping into life more and more fully. So apathia is not no feeling at all, it's feeling that has been cleansed or purified of possessiveness, of acquisitiveness, of directedness, but is instead has a kind of disinterestedness actually. It's able to step back even as it steps into, for example. It's able to discern where your sight is shaped by fantasy and to find, therefore, where it's shaped more fully by truthfulness. It's clear-sighted. It's objective in a certain sense, but objective only because it sees the subjective richness of the divine life in all things. It's a kind of illumination that brings clarity, therefore, but also a kind of simplicity. Part of the easing of the anxiety of this awareness is that 
the essence of things, the truthfulness of things, the divine presence in all things is seen. And that has a simplifying quality rather than fearing a kind of complex, overwhelming experience of life. Evagoras is interesting too because he says there can be anger in this angelic seeing, but it's an anger that wants to highlight and detect, discern when the experience of life falls away from all that it might be. It's not an anger that's kicking out, out of fear or out of anxiety, out of possessiveness, out of the sense of separation. So this is all about for us how to be in the world but not of the world. And Rowan Williams draws out how this might be so in various parts of his book. A key theme is living in the presence of now. So it's not fearing the past or the future, but being able to respond to the divine life in the here and now. He explains that this is so important because it's about responding to the divine life of the spirit in the here and now. And it's only by being able to see that and respond to it that we can be drawn back towards the divine life, which was the way we were created and is also the future. Dante saw this as well, that the trouble that the souls in hell have is that they're preoccupied with the past and so can't change. But coming more and more into the experience of our life now, in its suffering as well as in its joyful anticipation of the future, is precisely what enables us to move more fully towards that future. Another way of putting this is that it's about working doing good works, you might say, not out of the hope for reward or building our own sense of righteousness, but working now to remember who we truly are. The act of charity isn't about me giving to you because you need and I have. It's actually about remembering that we have this canotic, ecstatic mutuality, mutuality that we share between us. We are not really here. When we forget this, Williams puts it in an arresting moment and we can become conscious of that through the gift of being here. And it can happen in surprising ways. He continues, we learn to use our very dividedness to cast into a stronger light the possibility of a proper presence. This is when our suffering changes its quality to us because it becomes a reminder of where we might step into rather than that which might threaten, perhaps even feel like it would ultimately destroy us. And so he explains how in the Eastern Christian practices, a joint activity of contrition as well as gratitude is the constant reflection of the monk or the nun, because thereby they keep their current nature and their future nature before them and so are able to move from the one to the other and not be just lost in the sense of separation now. In another moment, he also says that we're a bit like children who are saying words that we don't fully understand, but by keeping on speaking them, we gradually realize more and more the meaning that they have in the adult world. And so the child is able to move into the adult world. So too, we are given these words, this sense of things like canotic, like ecstatic, like eschatological, by the various traditions which we belong, like non-dual, non-identity, and by using them, by repeating them, by reflecting upon their meaning, we get drawn more and more into their meaning, and so taken back to the life which is the divine life. Rome Williams occasionally touches on examples of this. One that recurs a few times is that of the artist. The artist who treats their work as being given to them, so their life is in a way one of contemplation, with their materials so that their materials then take a form that seems to come from beyond just the artists themselves and Williams explains this as their eros, their longing, aligning with the eros within the object or the person that they're seeking to represent and when these two eroses come together the artwork spontaneously as it were springs into life. You have to do all the practice with the material of course so you can use the materials but the source of the artwork is from the life itself, not just from the separate life of the artist. Um, the philosopher too, when speaking truthfully, will have a parallel experience because then their words of wisdom will be felt to release a life that's beyond and through the words themselves. And so in the communication between, say, the philosopher and the listener, a sense of something stirring and then awakening and then being seen will be shared by the collective endeavour. 
it's not about the philosopher intimidating or undercutting or reducing the person to whom they're speaking. And this is the epiphany that is needed now. It's a kind of gift of wisdom that will be received by reflecting truthfully upon how we fall short, but also to see how this is a kind of remedying of our ignorance about life, this reduced understanding of life that seems so much to characterise the Anthropocene, to step into the fuller life. It's about awakening, imprisoning accounts of who we are, Rowan Williams says, by this kind of watchfulness, by this awareness, noticing whether we're adopting diabolical ways of being or the angelic ways of engaging with life. And he runs through how this will lead to a number of reversals of the way that we think. So, for example, he talks about how reason won't be seen as the capacity to manipulate, to understand, so as to force and push into ways that are led by our individual will, but instead reason will be understanding how relatedness manifests itself in what we see. A world whose sanity has been restored, he said, would be one in which reason had been rediscovered as a condition not of instrumental control and conceptual precision, but of appropriate responsiveness to the human and the non-human order alike. Irrationality, he says, is being out of alignment with what's truly the case, both in oneself and also in the world. Irrationality, he says, is at this level humanity at war with itself, and this is inexorably our destination, if we become incapable of asking about how we might become receptive and attentive to the logos level, to the rational level of the cosmos. It's possible to not only to make mistakes about the world, but to be mistaken about the world's very nature, he says, and that's where we find ourselves in the Anthropocene. But it's also possible to become aware of that and so to step back into a fuller reason, a fuller rationality that's based on relationship and seeing truthfully rather than instrumental control or just precision for precision's sake. What we mean by nature will change as well because to be natural in this understanding is to be as God intends things to be. It's not to be, say, part of a biological me mechanism or a great system of evolutionary survival. Rather, it's about seeing the beauty, the loveliness, the integrity in all things. And how to be unnatural is to be in bondage to a separate self that's fighting to survive. God is painting a self-portrait in the elements of human nature, Rowan Williams puts it at one point. Now, clearly this is quite a challenging view because nature has suffering, has struggle. But the view understands that there's actually nothing evil in creation when it's seen correctly. Everything is seen within the frame of this kenosis and this ecstasis. And whatever that might mean, he says, it's about seeing things not because of their function, not because of what they do, but because of who they are or what they are in relation to the whole. It's an ecology rather than a fragmented world of separate striving individualities. This is unpacked maybe in a different way when Williams talks about solidarity and he wants to draw a distinction that was made particularly by the Orthodox Saint Maria Skopsova where she talked about how there's a kind of political solidarity that's based on sameness but a sameness that's often established because of the desire to achieve a shared goal against and over a common perceived energy. Maria Skopsova said, no, there's a different kind of solidarity that paradoxically is actually based on otherness, but knowing the connection in this otherness. Her type for this actually is Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she knew of her solidarity with Jesus, not because Jesus and her were the same, a mother and a child are never the same, and yet there's an unchosen solidarity that they share because when Jesus suffered, Mary suffered too. When Jesus rejoiced, Mary rejoiced too. And so there's a different kind of solidarity that we'll perceive, which is in principle extended over the whole of humanity, not just individual and separate interest groups at war with one another. And so that new kind of solidarity has obviously obvious application for today. Christian apologetics, 
Apologetics for religion in general will look different, Rowan Williams says. He says we must abandon completely the idea that Christian language and any religious language in principle works by drawing conclusions from external data as if it needs empirical evidence to establish itself. He says no, rather apologetics, religious reasoning, celebrates and deepens, discerns the contemplation of reality as it actually is. Faith doesn't need reason to support us, as it, as it were, as if it's got defects that reason must somehow make good. Rather, faith is acknowledging that life is reason, intelligence, love, desire, fulfilment, participation, bound together. And telling that story will be the way to communicate these truths going forward. He thinks that politics can look very different too in this light as well. In a way, it will look familiar, but it will also look foolish. It will look familiar in the sense that it will be concerned for the other and the other in distress. So he says, a politics that fails to secure the vulnerable nationally or internationally and treats categories of people as dispensable or that is systematically indifferent to the degradation of the material world or that drains the lifeblood from education or undermines its necessary diversity and appeal to the imagination or that shores up spiraling inequalities in the levels of human well-being and refuses critical engagement with a financial culture dangerously out of touch with reality. All the ways that politics fails will be addressed. And yet, at the same time, there'll be a different sense in this politics. It particularly comes, I think, with the notion of justice. Because Williams explains that this new idea of justice, the divine sense of justice, is not about fairness, as if reality is limited and so must be distributed in the best possible way. There will be some of that going on. But that sense of justice will be outshone by a notion of justice which is older, it's actually about seeing the world aright. You get it a bit in phrases that use the word justice when they say things, for example, you know, the movie did justice to the book, or I hope I've done justice to explaining Williams's book. It's the sense of justice that's about looking, content, contemplating, seeing, understanding, and communicating all that you can back to that which you're looking or sharing in the life of. So this is going to be about a politics that focuses as much on educating ourselves and our passions, how we move between these diabolical and angelic ways of seeing things. It's going to be a justice that values the flow of information, not because freedom of speech is a good thing in itself, but because it enables us to see truthfully the world around us better and better. And it's also going to be a kind of justice that's able to take a step back, that's not just going with the flow of the 24-hour news cycle, responding unthinkingly and instantly to that which is most pressing in the moment, but rather can resist that even at the risk of seeing cool and indifferent, but in order to provide the space to understand what's going on in relation to this bigger picture, rather than just to the concerns of the moment. And that's quite a risky thing to do, but Williams says will characterise a nude politics. He puts it so strongly as to say we must learn to distance ourselves from our commitments in politics, to ask continually what are we committed to, by seeing more fully what's there and so adjust, adjusting our commitments as we things, see things more truthfully. But the hope is that by attending to the world, he writes, we find ourselves wishing to control it less and instead being able to rejoice in it less, to experience the wonder of the world around us. And that in itself brings an alignment that will change the nature of our politics. Hospitality is a related theme here. He talks about how the divine life of the source, the, the word and the spirit is an infinite, undefended hospitality to the life of the other so that it becomes one life. And so practicing that hospitality in our own life in the ways that we can is an important way of aligning our lives with the divine life. And it's always one that's marked by freedom. The divine life is free in this mutual giving and receiving and so all our actions must be undertaken in so far as is possible out of a sense of freedom, not out of a sense of moral duty, not out of a sense of righteous imperative, 
but out of a sense that it's moving us more and more into a life that's bigger than our own. Again, this is the important sense in which our life doesn't need to be overwritten, it doesn't need to be replaced, it doesn't need to be pulled out. Rather, it needs to discover its truest nature and so grow and expand into that. There's no competition between God and creation, between the infinite and the finite. Rather, the creation and the infinite is moving into this non-dual, non-identity, which is its own already, if only we knew that. Rome Williams writes, the renewed mind is free to share in a network of embodied interaction which it attends to, learns from and takes time with. The mind is not driven by the need to use its environment to find answers to its questions or satisfaction of its wants. Hence the appropriateness of calling this sort of awareness contemplative. It begins to see the whole of life as the self-communication of God as having a quality of presence or transmission that's constantly speaking and drawing us back to the richness of divine life. And so this is our future, Rome Williams talks about in relation to this Eastern Christian word divinization, which doesn't mean that we gain superpowers, rather it means that more and more our life is known to us and seen by those round and about to share in the divine life, which is one of mutual sharing, giving, love and joy. So here's a final quote from Rome Williams that speaks to some of these rich themes. He writes, as finite reality opens itself more fully to the creative act that sustains it, as finite reality becomes more receptive and responsive, as it comes to actualize the image of the eternal logos, so we will be able to respond to the challenges of the Anthropocene, recognise how a future to which we seem to be headed is untruthful and become more aware and capable of embodying the future that is truthful, that is a reflection of Trinitarian life known in this non-dual, non-identity way.